Hello there, this is Daniel from 123 Muse, and in this video we're going to be looking at Adobe's all new Project Felix software. Um, for those of you who've been waiting for this software, such as myself, we've been very excited to get our hands on it and to start playing around with what we can do inside of Project Felix. For those of you who don't know what Project Felix is, we're here on Adobe's website for it. And uh, there's a great explanation here. It says, composite 3D and 2D assets into real photorealistic images without a steep learning curve or complex workflows. Just drag and drop a 3D model material and a light into your scene. Then choose your background image. Felix will automatically detect the horizon line and provide grid lines to help you align and place your model. Felix can even use the background image to generate the right lighting. So we are going to do all of these things in this video. Video. What do you use Project Felix with? Well, Adobe Stock, which is Adobe's website for purchasing and downloading stock images and um, graphics and other design elements, including videos, they have a new 3D section. In this 3D section, you'll start to find all of the things that you need to use in Project Felix, like 3D models, lighting setups, and materials or textures. You can use um, anything from other sources as well. You don't have to use them from Adobe Stock, um, but it makes things very straightforward as Adobe um, then loads these things into your CC libraries. So what does Project Felix do? Project Felix is a compositing software that can composite 3D models into a background image and make them look very realistic. And it does it without having a person need to learn a very complex piece of 3D software. Let's take a look at what that really means. I'm going to quit Chrome here and I'm going to open up a set of images that I've found to help see what this is all about. So this first image I've got here is an image of a background with a 3D car modeled and composited on top of it. Now it looks pretty um, realistic here. It's got the shadow underneath it. It's got lighting and reflections that make it look as if it's really there. But if we look at this other picture, of what it was before, we can see that it was just a 3D model that was um, placed on top of it and then rendered, um, which means converting a 3D image into a 2D picture using a computer piece of computer software. It was rendered to make it look like it was real. And this is what Project Felix does. So why would we use something like Project Felix to render something 3D instead of just using Photoshop, instead of just using a flat image? Well, let's take a look. I've got this picture of a coffee um, cup here, and this is a 2D picture. Now I could uh, cut this picture out. I could put a customer's branding on this using the different tools inside of Photoshop, and I could put it on a background image and it would work fine. And that would be absolutely perfect. But what if you found a background image that you wanted, or you f a customer found a background image they wanted, or even took a photo inside their store and wanted you to put the coffee cup there? Well, then you'd have to search through on the internet and try and find a coffee cup that was um, the photo was taken in the same angle as the picture that you've got and um, it would make things quite complicated. However, if we take a look at this 3D model I've got of a coffee cup here, we have a very similar coffee cup but because this is a 3D image I can move this around to fit any background scene um, to uh, be able to look like it's really there. If it's a steep angle, if it's um, looking from the bottom up, whatever it is, I could do that. I could also duplicate it and have this coffee cup in all different places. However, the complexity of learning how to use a piece of 3D software has sometimes um, stopped people from doing this compositing. And uh, for this reason, Adobe has gone ahead and made Project Fle Felix to try and speed this up and make it um, quite simple and uh, make it something that you can fit into your own workflow. So we're going to learn all about that now in Project Felix. So let's go ahead and we'll open up Project Felix.
When you first open Project Feelers, you'll be offered with a couple of different options. The first time you open it, this um, intro video will be highlighted in the center of your window. Um, after the first time you've used it, um, the intro video is still there, along with a guided tour, but they're at the bottom of this dialog box. Um, we're going to create a new project, and by clicking on Create a New Project, it's going to open up our main interface of Project Felix. I find that on my Mac, this is opened up in a windowed um, size, so I just have to go ahead and maximize it. Now, I'm running this on my Mac, and um, it's a MacBook Pro that I'm running it on, a 2015 with an i7 processor and 8 gigabytes of RAM. And it seems to run it quite well. Render times are a little slow, but um, overall it seems to do it quite well. Adobe has recommended that you have at least an i5 processor and 4 gigabytes of RAM because this is a quite a CPU intensive um, piece of software. I would also advise that um, you probably close down as many other pieces of software as you can before you start using Project Felix um, because the more that you have open, the more that they're using your um, CPU and your RAM memory and it can slow down quite a bit by doing that. Now, Project Felix obviously is a fledgling piece of software right now, so things like RAM usage and CPU usage may alter as they bring out further editions of it. Okay, so we've had a brief talk about the kind of hardware that we're using, and let's go ahead and dive into this interface. The interface is set up in two different main parts. You have your design part, and then you have your render part. So let's take a look at the design part. This is where you bring in all of your um, 3D models and background pictures and you set everything up. And then the render section is where you go ahead and create your final image from the things that you've set up. So you have a couple of main different sections. You have your tools. You've got a set of tools to the left here. These tools are for working on the model, the 3D model itself, selecting it, moving it, enlarging it, rotating it, and so forth. You've got another toolbar here, which has got one set of tools while you've got the selection and move and rotate and then, um, enlarge um, tools and another set of tools when you use this magic wand, which we'll take a look at in a little bit. And then you've got a third set of tools here, and this is for orientating yourself around your workspace, and um, it's for moving around the camera. Okay, then you've got your scene, and this is the scene section right here. In the top part of your scene, you have got everything that is inside your scene. In the bottom part of your scene, um, you've got a section which is for choosing the things you want to put into your scene. So, first of all, I've got my assets. And inside my assets, I have a whole bunch of models, of lighting setups, and of materials or textures. I can refine these by clicking here just to models, or just lights, or just materials, or by doing a search. But these aren't the only models that I have. If I click over to my libraries, this will now open up my CC libraries. So any CC library that you've got with images and so forth, you can bring those into Project Felix. I've loaded up one particular library, my 3D library, with a bunch of things from Adobe Stock. And there I have a bunch of 3D models of lighting setups and of different materials. Then I also have images that I've chosen um, to use as test backgrounds for Project Felix. So those are all available to me. The center of this section ha is called document. This doesn't have anything in it right now, but when you uh, um, have things inside your main scene, you will see them listed here. Okay, moving on over, we have our workspace. And in our workspace, we have a scene as if we're looking through a camera. So if you were looking through the viewport of a camera, this is what you would be seeing. The bottom part here with this grid is our ground plane or our floor. And these red and blue line here, this indicates the center of the scene. So the camera will rotate 
around this area. To my right here, I have a small preview box. This will show a higher quality preview of what my 3D scene looks like. The scene here is only going to show an approximation of what it looks like um, because of the amount of memory it takes um, so that I can move around things quite easily and quickly. This preview here will show a slightly better quality version of it. I can hide this preview. I can also maximize it in my workspace. Then to our right, we have our info panel, and this gives us information about all the different parts of our scene. If I go over to my scene at the left and click on background, um, this shows the information from the background. If I click on scene, it shows me the information from the scene. First of all, camera information, and then lighting information. From there, um, in my workspace, if I wanted to maximize my workspace and stretch it across the screen, I could. I could click on this button down here on the bottom left hand side, hover over it, it says content, and by clicking that I maximize my workspace. Okay, so now let's take a look by putting something into our scene. Let's take a look how we can orient ourselves around it. So I am just going to put a cube in to start with. So to do that, all I need to do is to go over to a cube inside my assets and click it. Now it will place it in the center of my scene. Now, if I wanted to bring a 3D model in myself that I hadn't um, got inside my um, either my assets or my libraries, I could go to File and Import 3D Model. I can do the same for bringing a background image and an image-based light in, and we'll take a look at that a little more in the future. Okay, so now with my um, cube inside my scene, first of all, I'm going to take a look at my camera functions. So I'm going to click in my um, scene panel. I'm going to click on scene. This way I have uh, my camera information in my info panel. I can see that the size of my final um, render is going to be here, 1024 by 768 pics. Uh, this is what is set by default, but you can change this at any time. Below that, I can see the focal length of my camera. Now, this is approximately, um, right now it's set to 44, which would be like having a 44 millimeter lens on my camera. So I could go and change this to 35, and 35 is um, one of the very basic uh, cameras that we've probably all had at one time. So this is the approximation of looking through a 35 millimeter lens. However, by using this slider or by typing numbers in, I can change this to be 10 millimeter all the way down to 10 millimeter, which would be the equivalent of a very wide angle lens, which would be more of a zoom lens. So I'm going to put that back to 35. And let's now take a look at moving the camera around our scene. Well, I have in my third toolbar, I have the different um, things that I can use to move my camera around. First of all, I have, if I zoom in on here, I have orbit camera, pan camera, dolly camera, then I have frame camera to selection and toggle horizon control. So let's take a look how those work. By clicking on my orbit camera, then hold my mouse button down anywhere in the scene, I move my camera around inside the scene. So you do this to get the angle that you're looking for. And this is moving it around orbital, orbitally in a 3D space. If I click on my little hand here, which is my pan camera, I can now move my camera up and down and left and right. Then if I switch to my dolly, this would be moving my camera closer to my object or further away from my object. And with all of these, you hold the mouse button down on your workspace screen and just move your mouse around. At the bottom here, you can see that I have my preview now working. And it's what it's doing is it's showing a preview render of my object in the scene. Let me maximize this a second. And let's just take a quick look at this. So we can see that it is progressively getting more and more detailed. So what is it doing? Well, this is what is called a render, um, which is creating a 2D picture from our 3D scene. And it does this with a lot of clever mathematics. 
what it's doing is it's firing um, light into the scene mathematically, figuring out where it would bounce off things, where it would be absorbed in things, where shadows would be, and slowly and progressively building up a picture from that. Now this is just a preview render, this is not where your final render goes. And your final render goes on your other, your inside the render section of this software. Um, now I find sometimes I can speed up my computer a little bit by minimizing this preview screen um, because obviously this is another thing that's using my CPU. Right, okay. Now this next button over here which is framing camera to selection, what this does is whichever object you have selected it will frame it into the center of your camera. Where would you use that? Well, for instance, let's now move my cube right off the page. Now, say I was moving around in my workspace and I've either lost my object or I want to work on it and need to bring it back into the center of my workspace. I would just click this button with my 3D object selected and it would bring it back into my workspace. The other button on this tool panel is our horizon. Now I'm going to have to orbit my camera a little bit to be able to see that. So with this, you can toggle it on and off. And when it's on, um, you get this line here, which is depicting your horizon. I can hover over this line and when it's, um, when it's turned blue like this, I can click the mouse and I can move my horizon up and down. Now, in this, when I'm moving it up and down like this, I'm um, changing the horizon in a unified way, both left and right. But if I hover over these round circles here, I can alter my horizons left and right by pivoting it from one to another. Other things that I can do here is you see this button here. This is my altitude. So I can move my altitude up and down. And below here, I have my yaw and I can move my yaw around. So these are all different things that you've got to orient yourself um, around your 3D space. Now, when I'm not messing with my horizon, I prefer to turn it off. And this is because very often you will find that if you leave it on, you might catch it by mistake. And if you've gone and set up your horizon exactly where you want it, then that can be a real pain in the butt. Okay, now I can also change the orientation of my camera by using these numbers in my info panel. If I've moved something around and I just can't get it completely accurate and it might just need it to be just a little bit different than, than what it is. Here we go, sorry I was in the cube rather than the, rather than the scene. You see now as I orbit around you see, I'll zoom in on this section here, and you can see these numbers moving around. Well, these numbers are to do with the rotation and position of my camera. And if I was having a problem getting this exactly right, or I knew which exactly the number I wanted, I can go ahead, highlight one of these, type the number in there, and it will put um, dial that in um, numerically. So that's another way to do it um, outside of using these main tools here. Below this, in my scene on my info panel, I have got information about my image-based light. Let's talk about the image-based light uh, for a second. So what is an image-based light? If I go over to my scene panel and take a look at the different lighting options that I have, you see I've got these images here with spheres in them, and the background depicts what the lighting is. Some of them are like the black and white ones, they are more like studio settings, so if you wanted to, to use one of those it's like um, taking a picture of something inside a proper photo studio, and other ones are external and internal uh, lighting setups that um, emulate a scene. This one here has got sunrise camp set and then a forest one, so what do these do? Well image based lighting takes an image wraps it around a big huge sphere and that sphere is surrounding your entire scene, so this entire workspace here. And it wraps it around it and as the light is projected 
and sent through that sphere that's around your entire scene. It picks up the colour and the lighting of that image. So the parts of that image that were very bright will be very bright in your scene and the parts that had different colours will have pick up a tint of that colour from the scene. What is, is this section here? Why does it look so weird then? Well, what has happened is this is an image-based light um, that has been then wrapped around a sphere, but then flattened out. So um, you get this funny shape here. To grab a different light, all you do is grab it, drag it over, and you can just drop it straight in here, and it will update the scene um, to have lighting from that image. So here we see that my lighting has changed on my um, cube and it's got a more natural tone lighting and it's quite dark. And this is because um, this image that it's using is sunrise. If I zoom into this image, I can see that I've got some blues here, very dark blues, and I've got browns, natural tones here. And I've got this light right here, um, but that's not very much light at all. So that is creating a similar light as in this picture, it's projecting it and making um, this image here, this 3D image, look as if it was in this um, particular environment by making the lighting and the colour of the lighting the same. Below this um, image, I can alter a couple of things. I can alter the light intensity and the light threshold. This alters the light threshold closer um, to darks and to lights and I can adjust the lighting. As you can see, if I drop it down, it gets very dark, bring it up. Um, so although this image-based light is creating the light and helping the light be uh, similar to the, this environment, I can still adjust it here um, with the light intensity and threshold. I can also rotate this. Well, what's that doing? Well, remember we talked about image-based lighting being a big sphere around your workspace, having this image wrapped around that sphere. Well, if you move this, you're, what you're doing is that sphere that's around your, your workspace is now rotating. And so that is altering how where the light is and where the colors are on your scene. So this gives you a really high level of, um, of editability within your scene to get the look just as you want it. Um, we'll take a look at all of this in detail and it really do, will make more sense as we start putting things into um, a scene and showing how it works all together. But this is just getting us through the basics here. Okay, so next what we're going to do is we're going to look at the tools for moving my model. So over to the left here, I have my main model tools. I've got select and this will select my whole model. When I select it, you see that I get my pivot uh, and axis um, movement points. So this is depicting the kind of the center or where the model's center has been set to of this particular model. If I click this tool below this, and all of these tools here have got shortcuts, if I click this tool, which is move, now if I hold one of these particular arrows, I can then drag my mouse right click on the arrow and then drag my mouse and I can move that object in that one axis. So you've got your X and your Y and your Z axis. Z being the axis that goes into the um, distance, goes further away and closer to you and X and Y are your up and down, left and right axes. Um, then what I can do is if I hover over in the middle and just move this scene around a little bit. If I hover over the middle here, I can move it on theoretically on all these axes, except for because obviously my screen is 2D and it's only going on my 2D, so it can only go in two dimensions. So there's your different ways of moving that. Then scaling it, click in the scale tool, you'll see that these arrows change to cubes and this is for scaling. If I hold my mouse down while hovering over one of these, it will scale it in that particular direction only. However, if I hover over the center here, it will now scale it in a uniform manner, the whole object. 
And then we have the rotate tool and that does just that, it rotates it. Below that, I have my magic wand. Let's take a look at what that does. So my magic wand allows me to select a face of a 3D object. And what is it, the face of an object? Well, the face is when three or more edges of a 3D model connect. The space that's between those is called a face. And for um, putting materials on it, this is, um, is, is very important um, because by selecting a face, I can put a different material or texture on any face. Whereas if I select my cube altogether, I can only put a texture on the entire cube all at once. So there's a couple of different things that we can do with this magic tool. Let me just take a look. As you see, when we click our magic tool, if you take a look up here, we have a different set of, click it, we have a different set of tools. What we've got is we've got our regular selection, we've got the size of the selection area that we'll use, and then we can add to that selection, subtract from that section, or select similar. Let's take a look at this. So with just selection um, highlighted, when I click on a different face, it will just switch and select the one that I'm currently clicked on. If I click on the plus, well now what it'll do is it will add, each time I click on a different face, it will add that face to the selection. Same with the subtract, it will now subtract from that selection. So that's pretty much how that works. And we'll be using that a little later to put different textures on different faces.